Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, James here with you on uh, Wednesday afternoon. Is that right? Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Tuesday evening. Good start. And uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, this evening I am accompanied by a second individual. Hello. I'm Julian. Uh, and then we actually met uh, just by accident, not all that long ago. Uh, there was a big field outside the house here, and uh, you see me on the field, don't you? Yeah. In the morning, walking the dog, walking the dog and uh, we just got chatting. I thought it would be a good idea if we just kind of got together, and um, you're going to show us some records and talk about a few bits yeah. and bobs. So we're going to pass everything over, and I, I don't even know what's in the pile myself. So would you like to make a start, and then we'll see how this goes? Yeah. Okay. So I've had lots of brainstorming about which theme I'd go with this evening, but I thought we'll go with not Britpop. So I've got this theory that in the early 90s, British guitar music was um, really good, really exciting. There was lots of interesting things going on. And um, it kind of came to a halt as a result of Britpop. Not completely, um, but there was a sort of a hiatus of boring music um, around the mid 90s. Um, so I'm just going to talk about that a little bit. And I think we'll start with this record which is the last single released by the Stone Roses, One Love, oh. before their hiatus, before they went off and made um, the second coming, and they had all the legal problems as a result of their appalling management. So this is One Love, backed with um, Something's Burning, two very long, guitar-heavy, um, slow-burning tracks, kind of similar to Fool's Gold, which is perhaps my favourite Stone mm. Roses track. Got a great groove, that record. Oh yeah, I love the 12-inch version. I can dance mm. to that one all night long. Um, <laughs> Maybe another time. <laughs> you want a video of me doing that. Um, but this one, it's just a cracking, groovy, guitar-y, it's, sort of, it's got inflections of a sort of southern, um, southern rock, but it's not. It's just really, um, it's got a little bit of dub to it. It's a really interesting record. So produced by John Leckie. Produced course. by John Leckie, yeah, and he was still working with them. Did he produce the second album? He produced the second first. Coming. He, pro he started producing the second coming, and the only bit that he actually produced was the introductory noise at the beginning of the first track, um, <laughs> Driving South. <laughs> That's as far as he got was the noise, yeah. right, okay. And then what happened then, he just got cheesed off with the, the actual music. Yeah. He just wanted the noise to carry on. And I think he was on different drugs to the rest of them. <laughs> Right, so this is, what label have we got here then? Silvertone, this is the, still on Silvertone. The Silvertone label. So it's before okay. we threw paint at Silverstone, Silvertone's offices and got kicked off. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, big, big hoo-ha. I was just listening to the first Stone Roses album just two nights ago, would you believe? I bought the reissue uh -huh. from uh, Sainsbury's, or was it, no, no, Tesco, in um, Chorley. Correct. Which is a place here in North England. Uh, complete spur of the moment decision to buy it. I hadn't heard it for years. I got it on CD years, you know, years ago. I hadn't heard it for literally probably about 15 years, and I played it the other night on headphones, and it just blew me away all over again. Yeah. Absolutely amazing, amazing album. There's some cracking tracks on there, aren't there? I mean, mm. there's um, uh, Waterfall, mm. wonderful, mm. and I want Iron the Resurrection. Mm. Gives goosebumps all the way to the very end on that track. Next, we've got a band called Swerve Driver. Swerve Driver came out of the uh, shoegaze scene of the, or the Thames Valley scene, I think they were from Swindon or somewhere like that. Okay. Um, and they produced, um, this is, this is the, uh, the, the lead single from their second album, which I'll show you in a second. But this, again, it's a long track, duo, and it's just a slow burning um, <coughs> guitar duo, a sort of smoky sounding, um, almost Merrick. So it's got elements of shoegaze, but it's a lot heavier. Mm. It's a lot heavier. The, the drumming's are big. The, the, the singing is distinct, and um, uh, it's just a cracking record. Wait, really quickly, there is actually a fair bit of support for shoegaze out on the vinyl community. Well, yeah. It, until very recently, I thought I was a pariah for liking shoegaze and continuing to like it all through the. <laughs> it seems to have come round again. But yeah, it's come round. I was saying about slow dive, and, um, and I think I was the only person that bought the last slow dive album. But everyone wants it now. There's a few people. There's there's Lou on on, on the VC. Um, Daddy since size Sylvie loves shoegaze. There's uh, Ben Brinson, young Ben. I think he's only about 15, 16. Really, and he's he's dead into it. I must admit, I'm uh, I'm not that well versed in shoegaze. It was a musical movement that I never particularly jumped on board, and then I've not really been part of the revival of it. I haven't checked anything out, so it's kind of riding high on my list. Yeah, it's right there my primal sort of period of listening to music. It was the, the right. stuff that I was listening to when I was. Your primal phase. Yeah, you know. 
being an idiot when I was a kid. <clears throat> Driving too fast, smoking stuff. Why? <laughs> While listening to Swerve Driver. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, isn't it? That's, a, that's a, just a wonderful record, that. And this is a single or an album? That's a single. Single, right, okay. So I think that's about 9 minutes 40 of building, dubby, grungy yeah, yeah. heaviness. Okay. And then what's this next one? Well, know? this is the album that came from, which ah, is right. so Mezical Head. Oh, I've seen this. I've seen that. I've seen people show this. Yeah. So again, this is a bit of a diversion, totally from the from the shoegaze scene. This was actually played on like the Tommy Vance rock show at the time. The Friday rock show. Yeah, because it's quite it is quite heavy in places, but it's still got um, it's still got the wonderful songs in it. There's still lots of melody, and you don't fall into the the um, the cliches of heavy metal that I don't dislike. Right. Um, so there's, there's no sort of uh, wailing uh, sort of yeah. and, and you know. It's a great cover. That's cock rockery. <laughs> cock rockery. So who wears Swerve Driver? Give us a bit of lowdown on who they were and why why they exist. Oh right, Creation. Yeah, they were on Creation. Right, so Alan McGee, mm -hmm. pre Oasis, obviously. We're talking yes. early, kind of early part of the nineties. So in the yeah, in the, in the early nineties, um, uh, Creation really were the, the band for the, the label for uh, for shoegaze. So yeah. they had Slow Dover on there, Rider on there, My Bloody Valentine, obviously. Okay. I'm really not up on this stuff at all. I just know me Beatles and Miss Stones, you know. So uh, it's good to talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. I've, I mean, I've just walked in and, you know, I've just seen Johnny Young's records for the first time. And it's, it's always so fascinating when you see somebody else's record collection you see, and you see immediately how you've got certain overlapping areas, but then it's sort of different emphasis. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm much more of a classic rock uh -huh. person. I'm very, very, uh, very traditional, you know, whereas your, I think your roots are more in the kind of 90s, aren't they? Well, the eighties in eighties, uh, sorry, the yeah, eighties, yeah, nineties. Right. But I did, I did, I have ventured in into classic rock, but not <laughs> to the depths that you have. The depths. I mean, I've got the dark a fairly depth. comprehensive Dylan, Birds, uh, Buffalo Springfield sort of yeah, that sort of area. I okay. Like all that sort well, we can do that another day. Yeah. Let's just carry on with your superb collection of um, okay. things I I don't know about. So then we move to um, the Verve. Well, the Verve has to record in this point before um, the American jazz label decided that they wanted to sue them and make them change their name. So this is the album, this is the first album by the Verve, again produced by John Leckie, same as the Stone Roses. Great cover. Yeah, so th it's um, a great cover. It's a great cover all round, in gatefold, um, sort of dioramas, um, for the, based on the, um, on the, on the, the tracks within it. Can't okay. quite explain exactly how it works. <laughs> but this is real space rock. So mm. again, it kind of came out of shoegaze. This is a band from Wigan, so they weren't connected to the um, sort of more southern airy fairiness of what was going on down there with your rides and your slow dive. They were proper hardworking northern lads. Hairy chested. Well, not um, cadaverously skinny is what they were. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Thing is, yeah. It, I'm, the Verve to me were the ultimate nineties muso band. Really. I don't know in a bad way. I mean, Richard Ashcroft seemed to just have heard everything. Right. I read some interviews somewhere. Some guy, I think it was their, maybe it was John Leckie, said, uh, I tried to turn Richard Ashcroft onto various music. I tried to play him this, I tried to play him that. Every single thing that he tried to play him, he'd, he'd heard already. Right. He had this just incredibly omnivorous, He, you know, he just seems to have ingested everything. So like I said, space rock, it's completely out there. The guitar playing is what really drew me into it, of uh, Nick McCabe. Mm -hmm. It's completely meandering, it's a lot of echo. Mm -hmm. you, you played through a role in Space Echo, I believe. And I think, again, John Leckie said of him, he was the best guitar player he's ever worked with, mm -hmm. but he could never play the same thing twice. Which <laughs> must no, be right, utterly okay. infuriating. As a bit like Sid Barrett kind yeah, of yeah. approach. You can imagine it from uh, stuff like Star Sail and The Sun, The Sea, it's just sort of, washes of guitars that sort of that floating out of one another in a, in a really kind of heavy, distorted, but reverbed way. Sounds amazing. Yeah. It's just, one, and Butterfly, for example, it's a song about chaos theory. Okay. And it sort of washes about and yeah. comes in and out. And um, so with the verb, this sort of area of thing, uh, British guitar rock that I was talking about, really had a front man that was charismatic and mm. um, very charismatic and yeah. a dickhead enough to be um, <laughs> appreciated by the wider audience yeah and um, but unfortunately the, the, the chemistry between Ashcroft and McCabe meant that they kept having these uh, these uh, hiatuses 
if that's the plural or hiatus. Hiatus. Hi hi. Now, just get me the chronology straight. You're talking about non Britpop. Mm -hmm. So, to me, Britpop starts with a bang uh, with um, Park Life. I right. mean, it's obviously it's kind of rooted a bit before, but so so where does this sit in relation to? This is before Park Life. This is before Park Life. Is uh -huh. it? It's probably about the same time as Modern Life is rubbish. They get a little bit more focused when they produce their second record, a, a Northern Soul. Plenty very, of very, very, very shiny. They were definitely going down a more shiny yeah, route. Yeah, uh, He's buying some feelings from a vending machine. He's buying some feelings from a vending machine. What is the lyrics? And it's a double. Yeah, it's a double. Right. Okay, you, you talk, I'll show. I just need to quickly remind want. myself of the Sorry. track listing, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the tracks on here, like This Is Music and uh, A New Decade, okay. are just astonishing. And this is 95 now, 1995, so yeah. now Britpop is now it's just about definitely up and yeah. running. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just I go onto YouTube immediately and listen to This Is Music and A New Decade. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. It's rousing, it's emotional, it's got um, sort of visceral guitar playing and, and interesting lyrics. And is it, is it still Mick McCabe? Yeah. Right, right, yeah. okay, okay. So they produced this record and uh, they, they toured and I saw them on this tour and it was just brilliant. I thought this was, this was going to be an absolute killer record that was going to take um, guitar music into the sort of interstellar overdrive to... Yeah, I, th I mean, I think we all, we all sort of recognise the expression on the... Uh, Richard Ashcroft's face, I and mean, he became so iconic when they did um, Bittersweet Symphony. Yeah. I mean, it was. The, I mean, I remember just watching MTV and VH1 at the time, and you could not escape from that song. But that was probably not that long three, after. Two, three years. Two, three years after. Because, years after, because after this, song, they okay. split up. They toured it, and then they split. Right. And right. I was much upset about that. Previous album, the Verve had supported Spiritualized at some point in the early nineties. Right. And um, Richard Ashcroft basically stole Jason Pierce's girlfriend. Richard Ashcroft. Still right, and, did, um, and, and so that was like a George Harrison Eric Clapton moment. For yeah, me. well, um, I'm trying to remember the moment of the, the woman in, in question now, but she was the keyboard player from Spiritualized, right? And uh, she'd been going with Jason since they were teenagers, okay. And yeah, basically, she ran off with with uh, with uh, Richard Ashcroft, broke Jason Pierce's heart, and that's why we got the wonder of uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're floating in space. Is that where the song I Have a Broken Heart yeah. comes from? It's all starting to make sense. So as a, as a result of that, can join now. I mean, you can hate Richard Ashcroft for having done that, but we can also love him because we got, ladies and gentlemen, of floating in space out of it. Okay. Which, uh, and did the friendship ever rekindle? I'm not sure. End? I doubt it very much. <laughs> right, okay. Is okay. It, last time I saw uh, Richard Ashcroft, he was driving through Chiswick in an open-top 1960s Mercedes with yeah. Kate Still can't quite remember her name <laughs> sitting beside him. What do you make of it? I've heard Richard Ashcroft's latest kind of musical it's kind of right, Very Radio it? 2. I mean, his songs get played on Radio 2. And when, yeah. I, when I hear them, I think, God, it just sounds like quite kind of bland chart music, but with Richard Ashcroft singing. It sounds like he's totally... Maybe his manager has just said to him, Richard, you know, those days have gone now. You're no longer this kind of psychedelic rock avatar mm. if you want to make some money you better get on radio too and just make some very accessible sounding well work. i think he was spoiled by um my noel gallagher myself there's a track on the last album we looked at their northern soul called history in which okay. it's a fairly sparse minimal track mm. um just got a bit of guitar on it um and the lyric is kind of good. it's mostly stolen from um blake um, William Blake. William Blake, not Norman Blake. <laughs> and, um, I don't imagine uh, Noel Gallagher would have lifted many lyrics from no. Blake. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a cracking track. But um, Noel Gallagher heard that and, and wrote um, "He Leaves No Shadow," I think, or something like that, and claimed that "Cast No Shadow." Cast No Shadow, and claimed That's that Richard Ashcroft was the greatest songwriter that um, was not being heard because by that point the verb had split, and I think all that kind of went to his head and made him think that he was a a cracking <coughs> songwriter in his own right without Nick McKay. He did appear to get very big-headed quite quickly. Yeah. That was my kind of uh, assessment that, of him. That, that's what I think. And then we get to this record. Now, even I know this one. So the verse split. Um, a couple of years off, Nick McKay went off and he produced, I think, the first EP by the Beta Band. Good band. Yes. I saw them. I saw them. Really? Good yes. band, yeah. I've got the first In EP fact, I did notice that over there. there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some of the bits and pieces. But then they got back together again um, and they produced this in the height of the Britpop era. 
I mean, it's got some good stuff on it. I mean, I mean Bittersweet Symphony is a fantastic song. Yeah. Drugs uh, Don't Work, of Drugs course. Don't Work is a great song. But then it's got stuff on it like um, well, Lucky Man. Lucky Man, you could see the set, the rot setting in there. It's it's pure dad rock. He's sitting on a stool with an acoustic guitar. <laughs> and, uh, he did go very dad rock. He did. There's nothing, there's nothing happening from that point forward to me as far as they're concerned. <clears throat> I don't think I bought any more of their records after that. Oh yes, there's that very distinctive photo. He was so emaciated, wasn't he? Oh, he, yeah. he had that kind of... It's weird, he looks like Mick Jagger crossed with Keith Richards. I mean, can anybody else lay claim to looking like an exact... Because he's got that kind of Jagger-esque, he's got the lips, he's got the Jagger-esque... Whatever, but oh yeah, he was the package, wasn't facially, he? Facially, he looks he like could have gone a different way. We could have had, he could have been the biggest rock star of the nineties, making great music. <clears throat> okay, all right, let's move on to another. I can see the next band coming up here, and this is a band that I briefly got into, uh -huh. but 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 the album before, yeah, that one, that one, yes. So this now this so, is, this has been shown on the VC as well. I've seen this album shown. To tie it all together, this album, um, which is. It contains multitudes, as people have said about other things. I think it was um, that William Blake again, wasn't it? Oh, was it? There was an American poet. There was a G G something. I can't remember. Was it w W. Oh, um, well, never mind. I'll put it on the screen. I'll put it on the screen. <laughs> yeah, you keep talking. It'll come to me. It's got. It's like a mashup of every single genre. There's dub in there. There's psychedelia. There's folk. Um, it's just. It's just like they've taken mm. a uh, opened up a. Um, mm. A, a cauldron of, of every piece of, of rock music mm -hmm. that went before it and stuck it in and see what came out. Is there not a bit of free jazz time? I mean, you've got the title yep. Giant Steps, which obviously references Coltrane, doesn't it? Yeah. And my, my memory, I've, I've not heard this album for years, I had it on CD, uh, but it, yeah, there was some jazz, free jazz and kind of a lot of feedback as well, yep. lots of screeching feedback. It's, it's quite constrained, It's not. it doesn't get over the top, there's a lot of, um, it's really controlled, the feedback. Mm. So, because again, they started out as quite shoegazy, and their first two albums. This is their third album. So, they, by this point, they've done "Everything's All Right Forever" and "Ichabod and I." Um, right. and this was their third album, and again, it, I used to listen to this all the time. I put it on, put it on, leave it running whilst I fell asleep and stuff like that, because it's it's got these wonderful um, explorations of noise and music and and sentiment within it. Um, the double album, obviously, as you can see. Martin Carr. Martin Carr, and a singer called Sykes. And again, the, the, the problem with this band is that they really were a, a sort of um, charisma black hole. <laughs> yeah, he was quite nondescript. Sykes, he was a little bald guy, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. He was quite good at dancing around, but he, he, he just wasn't cutting it. So that, that, that was the unfortunate thing about it. Cause it, it so my, my point kind of being, we get to this point, we've got all these bands and, 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 and a dozen more I could mention are making interesting guitar music and they're experimenting mm. with electronics, they're experimenting with the form and um, mm. changing the songs around and, and putting free jazz elements and dub elements and stuff in it. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 the last time I saw the Boo Radleys, well, they, yeah, I saw them twice, so the last time I saw the Boo Radleys was being supported by a band called Oasis. And they I came think I've heard of them. Oasis. Yeah, and they did a song. It was a cover of a Coca-Cola. It rings a bell. And I wasn't that impressed. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just going to say, because the date on this is 93. So now we're talking Park Life, probably 93, and Oasis's first... Well, no, because Park Life came out at the same time as the second Oasis album, didn't they? Yes, because, just because, a bit. Because there was, was a little bit of... No, 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 no. no was, they were getting on to the next one, uh, Great Escape. and Great um, Escape, and yes. And the second uh, Oasis album called... Uh, what's the Story of Morning Glory? Yeah, those two. I think it might be the third album when they did the contest, was it? I can't remember now. I can't think of that poet's name either. Right, so, yes, who we have? The Beautiful Label. I've never seen a vinyl edition of this. I've looked for one um, in the last couple of years. I've seen it going on eBay for anything up to, well, £100. Really? Yeah. Because these are all records that I bought at the time. So you should keep hold of these. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't let me go off with any of them this <laughs> evening. So then, after Giant Steps, which is... Everyone should own a copy of Giant Steps, really, if you're interested in music. Um, Except they can't afford to. Well, you get a CD. Downloaded. <coughs> um, then they made this album, Wake Up. Um, again, I should mention... Wake it. up, it's a beautiful, beautiful morning. morning. Again, on creation, all this, we should, we should mention. Um, and 
actually Martin Corrin Sice decided that they were, they were sick of all these other people making a lot of money by this point making a lot of money making simple simple pop songs mm -hmm. straight out of um, <clears throat> You know, straight out of the real building, sub pop songs and, and, and having hits. They thought, well, we'll do that and we'll just take the piss. So they wrote Wake Up Boo. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Just because they were annoyed um, to the Oasis and bands similar to that had been having these, these simple, simple pop hits. But it paid years. off for them big time. It was a yeah. huge hit. It was, wasn't it? It's, it's not bad at all. Um, but it didn't take off for them, you know, apart from Wake Up Boo. They didn't. They weren't able to follow up and come up. Like I said, they were a bit of a cruise of black hole. Do you mean that the album wasn't a hit? That the the single was, but the album didn't. Yeah, they sold a lot of copies of this, but I don't think anyone listened to anything apart from the, 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 right. it was the first track and then turned it off. It's strange and when they go back and it? explore the back catalogue, which yes. is what I was yeah, hoping yeah. would happen. And yet, a band like Oasis were able to release a song as massive as Wonderwall, uh -huh. and yet the album somehow managed to kind of hold its own because it wasn't just Wonderwall; it was Wonderwall and it was whatever don't look back and, yeah. and uh, you know so well I got I bought definitely maybe when it came out because um, you know it's got some good tracks on it it's not a bad record mm. um, and then there was a single that came up in between I should have pulled it out to, to show is the contrast between these and the, uh, the uh, definitely maybe was a huge success and then um, they released a 12 inch only I think single after that Noel made a lot of money and he hired a string section and put it on this track. You talked about whatever. Yes. I had a CD single of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's you know, I mean, I, I've got to say there is a fair, a fair bit of support for Oasis out on on, on YouTube. Yeah. So I believe that people like. Them. We don't want to not. I mean, I, I saw Oasis live. I did yes. see them live. Uh, I, I saw them in um, in an ice hockey arena in. Derby or Nottingham or so it doesn't sound terribly rock and roll no. and uh, they were they were okay they were right but I can see where you're coming from with this video I mean you've shown a lot of very very interesting kind of uh, diverse um, stuff which I suppose is is the theme that you're saying here that it was all slightly kind of next in the bud it was kind of it, it wasn't allowed to progress or Flourish properly because yeah. the Britpop thing kind of stamped down and went. It's just going to be Sleeper and Elastica and it's going to be this. It's going to be that. Yeah. And, the, and 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 then there was no space for all this exciting creative stuff. Quite. Uh, and because right. creation sort of they they, they chucked slow dive and um, and swerve drive and people had off the rust. They weren't going to produce the records anymore. Ride sort of became aimless and listless and produced two terrible records, <laughs> which I still bought. Um, but uh, yeah, it. Everything sort of ground to a halt. It was like um, a sort of Stalinist purge, if you will, of of, of interesting music. Um, and did it ever recover? I mean, well, kind of. There was always we haven't gone into the electronic music that's been produced at the time. Stuff like the Chemical Brothers, no, and Orbiter, no. and things I, like that. I've actually made videos on that very theme. Uh -huh. Yeah, because that was the whole parallel thing that was happening, which was very exciting. Yeah, and strangely enough, Noel Gallagher was always saying every time he made it, made another Oasis album, Noel Gallagher always used to go through the this ritual of saying, "Oh, the next Oasis album is going to be the one where I do this incredible kind of psychedelic thing," and he never yeah. actually did it. Right. Now he's doing it. Strangely enough, he's doing quite interesting electronic sounding stuff now. But back then, I don't think even with the huge success that Oasis had, my my reading of the situation is that he didn't actually have the the uh, you know the freedom that you know his record company was saying we need Oasis product and it uh -huh. needs, needs to sound like Oasis. I could be wrong but I mean that was my reading of the situation at the time. That Possibly. He, you know, even he wasn't allowed to kind of... I, I'm a bit less um, generous. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, Blur produced Leisure. They did. Which I got at the time because it, yeah. it was a bit shoegazy, it was a bit um, manchester -y. Bits of Barity. Bits of Barity, and it was really quite interesting. They had some crackers. There's a tra track on there called um, Sing. Yeah, it was well, it's quite sad. It's downbeat, and, and, and the, the sound of it isn't and like anything else that was being made quite at the time, or um, it's not easy to pigeonhole. So I listened to that record, and I thought, well, this band don't know who they are. They don't know quite what they're doing, but there's a lot of interesting stuff on here. I'll stick with them. So I bought the next couple of records, um, which were you know, Modern Life was rubbish, so that was quite interesting. And then they produced a couple of pure Britpop records after that were a bit less interesting for me. But then they came back with the eponymous album, the one with... Um, Woo! Yeah, that. And <coughs> it's, that's got some really great stuff on it. Was it what was the first one? It was a Beetle Bum. Mm -hmm. Beetle Bum. Which is written about his uh, heroin addiction, yeah. I believe. And that's a, I, I don't know 
quite like that. It's such an intriguing song. It's just got that simple lolloping. Mm -hmm. But you can, it's a sort of track you can imagine a couple of friends sitting around and playing the guitar and just playing it for hours on end. And it's a great riff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Graham Coxon actually, he was one of the big creative talents of the Britpop scene. He was probably oh, yeah. held in check a little bit because he had to he had to play second fiddle in a way to Damon Albarn's songwriting and mm. you know that kind of vision. But he was allowed to break out on that fourth album. But they got the thirteen was produced by William Orbit. Of course, electronic producer. Yeah, and I've got a lot of William Orbit's records um, from the, we're going back to the late 80s really. Um, really dancey, trippy stuff. Um, I was expecting something very different when that record came out. But what I'm trying to say was that Blur, although they, they fell into the Britpop pond for a little bit, you could tell there was much more going on, whereas you never got that impression with Oasis. No. Because no. when the second Oasis album came out, and it was so similar to the first one, yeah. I'd enjoyed the first one, you know, mm. I listened to the second one, and I thought, it's the same as the last one. I'm going to I'm gonna slightly disagree. I, I, I do think we should maybe save this for a second video. Oh. But, I, but I'll, I, I do slightly disagree. I, I think the second Oasis album was an artistic advancement on the first. I think it was the third album where it all went yeah. to up. But I think I think we get I think we're straying into very deep waters discussing this right at the end. So should we save that for another one? Okay. Okay. So I hope you've enjoyed this, folks. Uh, leave some comments below, and um, there is a record collection here waiting to be explored. And I think we both agree that we're gonna we're gonna explore it, aren't we? I hope so. Yeah. There are some some really Enjoy interesting things. There's some really interesting singles to be uh, uh, to be looked at and examined. So um, let's let's make this a regular thing, and we'll and we'll and we'll come back and do it again. Thank you. Excellent. See you soon, folks. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.